The next practical is about computational fluid dynamics, CFD. And it's going to be an example of the regular domain decomposition pattern. So, um, so it's just, just worth um, just mentioning, I mean, fluid dynamics, depending on what your background is, I mean, the dynamic fluid dynamics is the study of the mechanics of fluid flow, which could be liquids or gases. Uh, it's a very common use case for, so fluid dynamic simulations are a very common use case for HPC um, from either sort of toy models in theoretical study of fluid flow or engineering uh, engineering design of systems, etc., etc. So these are continuous systems um, typically described by partial differential equations, which are then which are discretized in order to be computed numerically on a grid. Uh, one discretization approach, well, what's used here, is the finite difference method. And it, ultimately what it comes down to is just that, um, as with many finite different method, methods, it's just that the, 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 value of the, uh, the value of the field that you're trying to calculate, which could be, in this case, the, the velocity of the fluid, for example, is some function, some combination of the values of that field or some other field at the neighboring points on the grid. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is to compute the flow pattern of a fluid in a cavity, where flow comes into the cavity from the right-hand side and is allowed to exit the cavity on at the bottom. Um, so for simplicity, we assume zero viscosity, as you'll see in the example, we can actually um, introduce viscosity into the system. Um, this has to do with, if you're not familiar with this, don't worry about it, but it has to do with rotational first versus irrotational flow. So with zero viscosity, which is the way that the code that you're provided with is set up by default, it means that there are no vortices in the, in the flow. So it's simpler. Um, uh, and you can optionally, as you'll see in the very end of the exercise, you can optionally turn on viscosity so you get vortices. What's the maths? Well, I, I mentioned the fluid velocity is a typ typically the thing you might want to actually calculate. Well, it could be the pressure as well, but um, this is done using a formalism where you actually compute a scalar quantum field known as a stream, stream function. So um, when, the velocity, when the viscosity is zero, that satisfies this equation. And when you discretize that using a finite difference scheme, then you get this relationship between the values of that stream function, the values of that field at the different points on the grid. So I and J indices refer to the X and Y two-dimensional grid. So I and J indices refer to the X and Y um, indices in, in the grid. So you can see here that if you rearrange this equation, rearrange it for psi I J, namely the value of psi at that point ij, then it's, it's a simple combination of the values of the neighboring points i minus 1 at the same j, i plus 1 the same j, or actually i is the row, so i, I minus 1 the same j, column i plus 1 and the left and the right. So it's a simple combination of the neighboring points. Um, so, uh, of course, when you get close to the edge, then the neighboring points at the, at the inlets are determined by the boundary conditions at the inlets, so the inflow and the outflow. So, um, so basically, it, and what this combination amounts to is just an average, actually. It turns out to be an average of the, of the neighbor points, just an average of the weighting neighborhood points. Uh, so you basically compute this for, uh, you start at the boundaries, compute this for all the, um, all the points in the grid, and then you do that multiple, you do it over and over and over again until, you, until the algorithm converges onto, um, onto a solution for the flow. The flow field. So in this, uh, in this, in this approach is known as the Jacobi method, Jacobi algorithm. So um, loop over all the points, and you do this calculation, and then you have a so you have a minus two two variables psi nu and psi old, so that you can then copy psi nu back to psi for the next iteration. Um, it's not it's not it's less important that you understand the actual details, physical details of the code, or even. I mean, it's useful to get the algorithm, but you'll see more details in the, in the sheet, in the handout that you can look at. And you can also look at the code if you like. So, um, the, some notes. Okay, so as I mentioned before, you can, you can introduce, you can set the Reynolds number, which is a parameter that controls viscosity, uh, to be non-zero so that you get some viscosity. So what you, what you will notice is that um, 
so, that, so as I, I said, you have to keep on doing this until the problem converges. Now, the way to judge this is um, you can actually look at, so what happens is as the algorithm is, is applied over and over again, uh, each time you run it for each iteration, the, um, the difference between the new values that you can put for the value side, all the grid points, is, is closer and closer. Um, the difference between that and the, the value side at the last iteration gets smaller and smaller. So basically, that is that is effectively a measure of your convergence, how far you've converged. So what you typically do in a simulation, you might say, okay, I put I, I specify a tolerance, and I require the simulation to run um, for however many iterations are required until, let's say, the um, the uh, average over all the grid points of the difference between the new value that was computed and the previous value. Is less than some than some small than some small value, uh, so that that would be some control on the quality. Um, but the way you, as you see in the sheet, the way that you run the program is actually you specify you don't specify the, this tolerance thing. Uh, you specify actually that you're going to run for a thousand iterations or five thousand iterations. You specify the number of iterations on the command line. So um, so this. Yeah, so you'll see that if you choose a larger problem, you will require more iterations. Uh, the RMS root mean square change in psi uh, is what I was is what I was referring to when I mentioned that you calculate the average. So you calculate the average uh, square root of the um, average of the square of the difference between the value of psi the new time step and the old time step over all the grid points. You'll see, you'll see this. Um, you can actually see this. In, Function in the code. If you, if you look at it, it's called delta squared. Uh, there are more efficient algorithms, but Jacobi is very simple. It's easy to parallelize. So you can actually. The reason why we compute the stream function that I mentioned is that you can actually compute the, the, the what you might care about more, namely the velocity of the flow directly from it. Um, and discrete, in discrete terms, it's just simply uh, it's a combination of the the um, Two neighbors, um, with x and y. So the general approach for this uh, that's implemented in the code that you're given is that it calculates the stream function, and that calculates the velocity field. So it calculates the stream function psi for all the grid points, and then it calculates the velocity field x and y components for all the grid points. Now both of those two stages involve um, calculating the value of each grid point by combining it with the value of the neighbors. That means that for each grid point, you're doing the same amount of work. So this is ideal for a regular domain decomposition approach where um, you simply split things up equally into equal chunks. So basically what you're going to, what the parallel version of the code does, the two versions of the code, as you'll see in the exercise, the serial version is a parallel version, the parallel version breaks up the grid into however many um, subgrids you specify by saying how many processes you want to run. Each process um, gets a subgrid. So the parallel version has been implemented using MPI. Um, so you're going to launch this with MPI run, or actually AP run uh, larger. Uh, and the number of processes that you specify determines how many subgrids there are. The thing then that, that needs to take that the code does, um, and that you need to do in these kinds of problems, which is kind of what we're going to demonstrate with this, is that uh, the with this algorithm, then the points and the edges of the subgrids, which are you know, the, each subgrid is being handled by a different processor. So the points on these edges uh, need to somehow, each subgrid needs to know about the edges on the other, on the adjoining subgrid, on the neighboring subgrid. So that means that the data is then needs to be communicated to these different processors. Um, so you could implement this as a principle with a shared memory model, but it's been implemented uh, in this case with a, um, with a message passing model, API, uh, where the processors uh, communicate so the way they communicate is, um, so, so the way it's been implemented is you have these boundary layers that are added to the subgrids along each edge that has a neighboring subgrid. Uh, these boundary layers, also called halos, uh, con contain essentially the values of the uh, edge of the points and the edge of the adjoining boundary, and they are updated not by the process that is actually computing all the values for the uh, bulk for the inner grid points in that subgrid, but it's updated by, it's basically being told what that value is by the process that's actually processing the adjoining subgrid. So these communications are going back and forth. So all these, all these edge points are being, all these halos, this is called halo swapping, 
and uh, as was mentioned, the blood electrode. Um, but this is done by interprocess communication. One minute over 11, and I know you probably want some coffee, but I'm just going to finish off uh, just quickly. Um, so uh, later on in the exercise, what you want to do is you want to look at uh, the performance of the parallel version of the code. Uh, and you want to use these performance metrics that were discussed um, in, in an earlier lecture, namely the speed up, how fast uh, process the parallel version of the code runs for n processes compared to one process, and the efficiency. So you want, you, you, what you simply want to do is experiment with this. So the practical to start, you compile it on the code of Archer following instructions, uh, ask us if you have any problems, uh, run it on different numbers of cores, and try different problem sizes. You'll see that the problem size, namely the size of a, the whole, the entire problem, uh, i.e. the size of the grid, is controlled by a single integer called the scale factor, as I'll explain in the slides. And then later on, after the lecture uh, about compilers and compiler optimizations, we'll return to this exercise um, and I'll return to the slides that follow um, to look at the effect of compiler optimizations. Discussing the, uh, the results that you um, may have gotten or, or trends that you may have seen in the scaling performance of the CFD code, um, both when looking at uh, simply the, the speed of as a, fact, as a function of the, the scale, um, scale factor of the problem, but also when looking at uh, possibly compiler optimizations that you may, may have tried and played around with. So, um, as you know, on Archer three compilers, Cray, Intel, GNU, and as Nick mentioned in his lecture on the compilers, um, things of Cray and Intel by default have more uh, optimizations turned on. Um, and the Cray compiler does a lot of stuff that is really tuned for the hardware, the platform that it's running on, the Cray machines, and Intel specifically does a lot of, a lot of optimizations by default that target um, Intel process, processors. Um, including in the past, I don't know if Nick mentioned this, but including in the past at some point, um, there was a, uh, an optimization in the Intel compiler which simply looked at whether the processor was an Intel processor or not. And then if it was, uh, it put, turned on a whole lot of other optimizations that you could potentially apply to in other cases as well. But uh, So it wouldn't apply those same optimizations in the case if it would encounter the AMD processor simply to make Intel processors look at it. Which I guess isn't, isn't that great from a user's perspective, but it's great from a vendor's perspective. Um, Anyway, so what you might, what you may have seen um, in your results if you explored different compilers is something like as sh shown in the graph here, namely that the runtime with the Cray Intel compiler, by the, by the, if you don't do any, any particular optimization uh, settings or flags, is that the runtime for Cray Intel a lot better than for GNU? That's simply, or, or probably, or mainly because GNU by default has a much less aggressive optimization level set. So you set these optimization levels like oh. Or, one, or two or three um, on the command line uh, or in the make file when you compile. There's details about this in the manual pages uh, for different compilers. Um, the, so the effect, so you can start off by, by, by being conservative and not doing some of these optimizations because some optimizations can affect uh, the exact reproducibility of results, which might be important for you. Um, it may change around um, or some order of operations, etc. Um, which can, in some cases, with very aggressive optimizations, generate um, uh, un unwanted results. So, um, yeah, so it might actually be that uh, in, in some cases, uh, if you turn on a very high level of optimization, uh, it, it should, in principle, given what the code is, be better in terms of the kind of features that are there in the code and in terms of what that optimization level tries to do to optimize the um, machine code that it produces. But it could still be worse because uh, you might get increased code size, which means that the actual instructions, the optimized instructions, actually don't fit as well in the caches that are available. So it's, it's a bit unpredictable, and you have to just play around with it and try it. And of course, if you're doing a lot of compiling, then aggressive optimizations can increase compilation time. Hyperthreading is something that's uh, worth knowing about. It's something that's uh, specific to Intel processors. So basically what they've produced is um, essentially with, with, with a lot of Intel processors, you have uh, every, every physical core, say, has, um, the, has the ability to, to um, um, run 
one additional sort of logical core. It does it by some clever interleaving uh, of, um, of threads. So they're called hyperthread speakers. You get uh, one thread, so it's I wanted an extra for each core, so it's hyper somehow. Uh, you can turn this on or off. By default on Archer, it's turned off. Um, you can turn it on uh, by using an option uh, for the AP run parallel launcher the, with the flag dash lowercase j, um, which specifies that if it's one, which is the default, then you don't use hyperthread. So that means if you have 24 cores um, and you typically uh, you have 24 threads that live in those cores, if you turn it on, then um, you will find that you uh, may, that you can might be able to run say twice the number of OpenMP threads efficiently. You may or may not. Whether or not you can benefit, whether or not your code will benefit and really run faster, ultimately in practice, from having these hyper threads available, really depends on the access pattern patterns that these um, that these threads have and what what your code does basically. So it's worth trying out. It's a it's a one line change, so you can you can try it out and see if it um, improves your performance. Um, for the CD problem, if you were to try this, you would actually see that it's a bad technique. So it it, 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 it gives you uh, worse runtime. Another thing to consider um, is process placement. Um, so I think it was I think it was discussed in an earlier lecture that on um, that um, a lot of processors have. Within a processor, you might have um, different regions that have that share certain level uh, that share memory at a certain level of the memory hierarchy, which means that uh, th threads running on cores within that region can access that memory faster within can access memory faster within that region than if they cross into another region. So uh, the Intel processors and Archer have each have two uh, of these memory so-called NUMA, non-uniform memory access regions, uh, one for each uh, processor. So, um, and there are 12 cores per region. There's no threads from running on the cores in one region trying to access data that's stored in uh, uh, the memory of the other region, then that'll be slower. And you can control what region uh, threads are placed in by some of these, uh, by in particular by this dash capital S option. Um, for APIs, these are AP run flags. So this is this is worth looking into if you look at the AP run manual page. I think for now, I don't want to necessarily go into further detail, but it's good to be aware that this can be something to consider when you're using Archer or something like Archer for real. So some of the results that uh, you may have seen was that um, as you for for a fixed um, for a fixed problem size or. For a fixed choice of the skill factor, if you keep on adding more and more processors, if it initially you're, um, uh, you'll get a speed up. Uh, but if you look at efficiency, then for sort of two processors, two processors, sorry, the two API ranks, uh, you get an efficiency of 194. This is, this is some results with a choice of uh, 1,000, 10,000 iterations, skill factor 40, and actually with a finite viscosity. So the, here you see the, the parallel efficiency. That metric is 0.94, which is quite high for two, two processes, but by the time you get to eight processes, you get, already it goes down to 0.4, which is pretty bad. Um, so typically, that, or that often happens where you have, uh, as, as you have a fixed problem size and you increase the number of processes, so you increase the division of the work, then in, in, in parallel codes where you are doing communications, typically what happens is that the amount of work done by each process starts to become small relative to the amount of communication that, that that process needs to do with other processes. So basically what you get is that your computation is dominated by, sorry, yeah, your computation is dominated by communications. Um, in this case, in this example, the runtime can become, becomes dominated by the API communications rather than actually doing the Jacobi algorithm. Um, if you, um, if you change the, so if you look at a, um, so, Another effect that you might see is um, the size of the problem that you choose may have an effect on the scaling behavior. So now in this, this example, we choose a rather larger scale factor, namely 70 instead of 40, which is in the previous slide, uh, 10,000 iterations. So here what you get is that the efficiency 
for 48 processes is really low, 0.3, and then suddenly, magically, at 96 processes, you get a great efficiency, you get 1.45 efficiency, greater than 100% efficiency. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing speed of compared to uh, one process. So what, that's, what, that, what that could be due to is because if you have a very large problem and you're running that on one process, then the entire problem is so big that when the process on that one, when that one process tries to process the problem, it has to go to memory, go to a slower, larger memory levels in the hierarchy like system memory RAM, for example, more often, uh, rather than the problem size fitting into uh, the cache, the different kinds of small bits of memory that are layered with, on different levels and different speeds and different sizes within the processor. So that can, that can really slow things down. And then what, happen, what can happen is as you increase um, the number of processes beyond uh, some, some number, some magic number, uh, in this case sometimes somewhere between 48 and 96, is that suddenly the um, problem size per process becomes sufficiently small that it actually fits uh, quite nicely within um, a, a, a memory uh, that is closer to the processor, therefore it's quicker to access. So these are cache effects, which can um, give you unexpected sort of spikes in your, in your speed up when you look at the scaling you're making. These are some uh, results which were produced, I don't know exactly when, maybe over, over a year ago. So um, these may or may not look exactly like what you found because they were produced with a slightly older version of the code, uh, with uh, probably older versions of the compilers. The Archer hardware is the same, but um, mm. other things may have changed. The MPI library might have been slightly updated. So here what you can see is that um, for the uh, small scale factors of 10 and 20 uh, and also 50, say, you can see that, well, for 10 especially, it, the, the speed up very quickly saturates and you get just diminishing returns as you increase the number of MPI processes. Um, for the scale factor 50, you can see that it almost wants to become, uh, it almost fits, it almost becomes super linear uh, for about, 180 or so processes, which suggests that these cache effects might be starting to play a role, but then you still get that ultimately um, the runtime, the, the speed up gets uh, saturated because of the communications dominating. Um, for larger problem sizes, 1700, you can see this, there's really this super linear effect. So this is on an older machine, so it's not necessarily worth looking at in detail. Okay, so that's an overview of, of the CFD. Uh, results give some idea about why you are seeing what you what you what you see um, when you look at this.